Welcome to the Prog Talks by the Prog Space. Welcome to the Prog Talks, an interview series by the Prog Space, where we will be talking to musicians in all corners of the progressive music scene. I wanted to, you know, make a little bonus with you in general about Prog, because one of the earliest memories of me seeing your name was with Norwegian magazine Tarkus. Yeah. which was started in 1995 if i'm not mistaken yes. and yes. and kept on going through the 90s and up, i think you guys ended the magazine in 2010 is that yeah. right at, at the spring of 2010 yes mm. yeah so i just wanted to ask you a little bit about how was the you know those early days in 90s before you started the magazine and then in 1995, you know, before the internet became so persuasive that you could like, you can find anything you want now. Yeah. How was Prog back then? How was the scene? How easy was <laughs> it to find the releases? And uh, well, it's uh, for a lot of younger people, you know, people that are in their mid. 20s now that they yeah. i think you can't realize how difficult it was to get hold on new music you yeah. know with, with spotify and all that streaming services and youtube and so on you you can you can discover music like this you know exactly but in, yeah in, in uh, but when i started I, I became interested in progressive rock at the i think 16 17 years old at the end of the 80s yeah, yeah. and uh, then i you know it just it was just by word of mouth, you know. Uh, uh, I discovered friend, yet, yeah. and, and, mm. and an old and, a, and an older friend of a friend of mine told me, that, "Well, you have this band called Genesis. They have also did this symphonic rock." And suddenly, it, it started the snowball. Yeah, it's spir know? spiraling into something. Yeah, spiraling into and and but in in Norway at the um, at the early nineties, it was kind of because I was very interested in doing something with progressive rock, but. I didn't knew anybody who was interested. In. Oh, who was he? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and and then it then Paul had his contacts, and I think the the two first was a couple of local bands that played something that was vaguely progressive, and the third yeah. band out was Engla, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was so. in October nineteen ninety three. Yeah, and the response that Engla got got in Norway was overwhelming and they yeah, were like, I agree. yeah they told themselves that wow this was wow what is this what's happening here because there was you had this early swedish swedish scene that was yeah. a couple of years before norway but they didn't have that much places to play concerts you know so uh, all this swedish band off uh, just a few months afterwards uh the F anecdoten played in norway lambeck played in norway yeah, lambeck, yeah 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 and all those bands and, and and they played in norway more than they played in sweden some of them and out of this interest this live scene it grew an interest for making a magazine and mm. together with jakob i started a magazine called hybris and that was very hybris because we yeah, we were just two young students with <laughs> that, that have never released a fan scene before. <laughs> oh, no. and, but after a couple of years, I came in contact with Rune Skav and Bjorn Lindna, and they started this magazine called uh, Prognetic, and they realized it wasn't market for two magazines in Norway. No, exactly. So, yeah. So, yeah, so it, it became a few. So Tarkus was a fusion of those two magazines, mostly Prognetic, I will say, because they were much more professional than us. And, yeah. But then after the first couple of years, uh, it became Sven Eriksen and I, together with, for quite a few years, with Jon Christian Lee, that was the main uh, main editors or... or yeah, editorial well, team for, for Torkus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we had a lot of guys uh, writing for us, a lot of very good writers, and... and uh, 
and and the magazine we uh, we had a lot of subscribers at at, at some part uh, quite a few hundred and and, and we got um, you know um uh, promotional copies of albums from all over the world so i got this network you know i i, I come i came to know so many musicians all over the world and then facebook came you know and everybody connected on facebook <laughs> yeah because that uh, well, was, then, what you're... yeah yeah, what you're mentioning there about the early 90s, uh, you know, and you started out saying that it's hard to imagine because uh, even, you know, a lot of the albums that are easily available uh, on uh, Spotify or, or streaming services now, they, they weren't even reprinted at that time. So you actually had to track down either an old copy somehow or find someone who had access to an old copy to be able to listen to some of these very rare at that point, albums. But yeah, now, it, I, now yeah. it feels like a lot of it is being since I, I feel like that started around maybe the same time as Tarkus. That yeah, some mid, labels mid, started mid, to reprint. Mid late, uh, something happened. Ninety six, ninety seven. Things started yeah. to happen because I, when you mentioned that it was difficult to get hold on albums, I have to I have to tell you this: the story of my of me. Uh, trying to track down the Spring album, you know. Uh, Spring was this British early prog band uh, with a lot of Mellotronas. All and the drummer later started as a drummer in, in Dire Straits, oh. Epic Withers. Yeah, and I remember I was reading about this in um, in an uh, in um, I think it was Record Collector, an article about obscure prog in Record Collector. Yeah, and this uh, and remind you, this was f before uh, the internet and uh, trying to call long distance call. It was like I was a poor student, you know. Yeah, I can, expensive. I can barely uh, afford <laughs> spaghetti, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so I so I wrote I wrote this letter to England. I got a response after kind of three weeks, and then I had to send money, and then it took three weeks to get. Yeah. The album. So from from I read about Spring to I had the fact uh, to have the actual copy in my hand. It took me kind of like nine weeks. You know, yeah. today it take you maybe nine seconds. <laughs> yeah, <it's like laughs> you you, you, get you, you type it into somewhere and you click and you can. <laughs> it's on the it's on Spotify on or on YouTube or wherever you want yeah. to listen to it. Yeah, I. But, but I, that, I I have to say that it's it's mirrors because I think my interest in prog came probably a few few years later than yours, and mm -hmm. my sort of awakening with prog came through uh, metal. So yeah. for me, it was like Queen's Rise, Dream Theater, Fate's Warning in the very early '90s. You know, they started releasing these albums that were very inspired by '70s prog, but also metal. So mm -hmm. I remember, you know, one of the early like '80s technical bands which is like described as trash meets rush is a, a band called watched over yeah, 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 and yeah. it was and it was impossible to find their debut album it was so i i was at vacken you know the big metal festival in the in the the mid 90s going around that record hall like asking every guy you know that's energetic disassembly do you have it do you have it mm -hmm. and then you know at the end you know not finding anything i was going back to my tent and some old german guy came running after me holding <laughs> up the album <laughs> <laughs> so so but like you said you know today you could just type it into youtube and you can listen to it in yeah. in, in 10 seconds yeah. so like you say it, it, it is a completely different thing and and so I'm guessing, you know, a lot of work went into Tarkus to be able to find, to listen yeah. to, and to recommend this music to people, right? Yeah, and it's, uh, yeah, and uh, I, I have, yeah, because what Tarkus was supposed to be, what, you know, was kind of this, um, it was kind of a, a blog before the blog, you know, to, to try yeah. to try to have one place to find information about all the new bands and um and uh, it went and it was a lot of work uh, especially for sven because he was the guy who who designed uh, did all that yeah to, did the layout and yeah the layout all that stuff yeah yeah uh but uh, uh well it, and it's it, but what, what was 
Uh, but we had this kind of we had this kind of a mission, you know, the mission state exactly. That was exactly. To spread the word about this music and uh, and, um, and and what, what was really heartwarming was that it's still a lot of people who you know take stay in touch, you know, about this. It's 10, 11 years ago, and they kind of yeah. send me messages and well, oh, can you? I have this. Uh, I think it's only a few months ago. Uh, some guy sent me on Facebook Messenger a picture of him sitting and reading an old copy, a worn out copy of yeah. Turkish magazine with, with a glass of red wine. It was like, wow. <laughs> yeah, for someone who who sort of really was uh, starting to discover the 70s prog during that era, it was a gold mine of not only the more, you know, the more known bands like your, you know, your Elps and Yes and Genesis, but also mm-hmm. like this sort of underground of existing bands and also yeah. strange 70s bands or like more less known 70s bands so Mm -hmm. so i think uh, but i'm I'm wondering then uh, this era that preceded when you started tarkus when you started to have an interest in prog it -hmm. seems to me like that was the dead era of prog or at least some people will will call it that right (laughs) those late 80s to early 90s it seemed like progressive music was struggling how did you did you have an experience of that, or is that something that sort of you dawned on you later when you started to become more knowledgeable? Uh, kind of. Well, it's. Um, uh, have you seen this prog rock Britannia uh, documentary where where uh, yes. Wakeman is telling about he, he went to this record store and kind of do have some. The dirty word progressive rock albums, you know. Um, under the counter. <laughs> yeah. So, sometimes I felt like that. But yeah. Well, basically, uh, I have to tell you this. I discovered progressive rock at the uh, I was 16, 17, and I grew up uh, just outside uh, Oslo. Uh, so it wasn't that m- many musicians, and none of them were interested in progressive rock. Prog? No. And but uh, and then I but I managed to you know play all kind of other music punk for instance and then I started at the university and I was like yes I can find cool musicians uh, because I knew there were guys at the university that love progressive rock but then grunge came along you know so yeah. everybody <laughs> nobody was interested in playing uh, old time signatures and uh, weird Arabic scales and so on you know. Yeah. So um, I was kind of struggling just to find interesting musicians to play with. Oh, don't misunderstand me. I a lot of very good musicians at that time, but they were not interested in playing. Intricate, no, you know, exactly. Complex. Exactly. I think that's interesting. Also, once again, because it mirrors sort of a lot of what was happening in metal. You know, you mm-hmm. had bands becoming more and more technical, uh, more and more, you know, uh, uh, adventurous and experimental with their music during the late 80s, early 90s. Mm-hmm. And then this wave of grunge hit and everything was supposed to be a bit more garage, a bit more down to earth. And, you know, it's sort of a, a bit like when punk arrived, like, right, you know, you're supposed to just plug in your guitar and play. We we don't have time for all this noodling, you know. No, no, so no. It, it's interesting to see how that that shaped it. But but Brog stayed alive in in, you know, in its own community and yeah. i guess that's what that's what what happened so um, but yeah let's... yeah it, it was kind of a small community and it was an international community uh, yeah. very early on i got in contact with people from all over the world and uh, because a lot of the guys uh, just by writing letters you know uh, to all these guys that because a lot of people had you know contact address uh, inside their CD booklets or so yeah. on. Yeah. In your best. So I wrote to them uh, and, and they, they answered back and we exchanged CDs and tapes and so on. And, and um, well, what I realized was that uh, even if Prog wasn't, uh, wasn't in the line of sight anymore. Yeah, it, it yeah. not in the limelight. Existed. Yeah, yeah mm. it definitely existed. Uh, and and then something happened around 95, 96, 97. Uh, you yeah. know, the, the OK computer, uh, the whole that stuff. Because exactly. when they started name dropping all these old weird... Uh, Bands, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it kind of 
uh, suddenly it was like, uh, is it okay to say progressive rock out loud now? Is it okay? Yes. <laughs> Wow, shit, what, what's happening? Can you, actually, can, can you actually write that and still, you know, yeah. have to be and, uh, interested in what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. And I remember so very well that when I started at the university in Oslo, I worked for a couple of years at the radio station in Adenova. And uh, nobody there was uh, uh, interested in progressive rock. It was like uh, yesterday's news and all that stuff. But yeah. after a while, at the end of the 90s and early 2000s, I all of them I met at all these concerts, you know, <laughs> these progressive rock concerts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they probably had this uh, plastic bag under the counter where they had these records. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know the feeling, you know. And and and. But let's let's move up because I think talking about that era and then moving up to 2021 mm. and these over the last ten years or whatever, this like. I would call it like an insane explosion of interest in progressive music, outlets for progressive music, labels that focus on progressive music. Just in Norway, you have uh, labels like Charisma and, of course, Apollon Records, which uh, bring out so many bands, all the festivals that are happening all over the world with progressive music. How do you view uh, the place for pro progressive music in? Um, Today, well, well, it's today. It's uh, I, I have never uh, imagined that progressive rock could be so big as it has become now. You know, yeah. Uh, not just only as, uh, as as progressive bands are. You know, uh, uh, take for instance Stephen Wilson. Uh, not, not his career is now turning towards maybe towards. Of the yeah. music, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but 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 in his heyday with 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 Porcupine Tree and his early uh, his early uh, um, solo, solo album, it was very progressive. Of rock course, albums. yeah, yeah. And he got. I, I remember reading about him in in huge British newspapers, you know, like exactly. the Guardian, Independent, and so on. And I've never, never, ever imagined that that should happen, you know. Uh, especially not in Britain, that all these journalists hated progressive rock. Exactly, uh, where, where that was like looked looked down upon so so yeah, yeah. harshly. Yeah, and 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 yeah. I also remember I had like this weird feeling. I think during the 2000s, sometime where when the Mars Volta ended yeah. up on like the Norwegian top 20 yeah. list or something with with one of their albums, and I was like. What the hell is going on now? Because this is, yeah. you know, this isn't poppy music at all. Did it, but it sells and it gets, you know, it gets spoken about and written about, and it's it was just a very interesting uh, revelation that this was coming to the forefront. And I think it has something, especially here in Norway. I have to say that uh, being a Norwegian progressive rock musician uh, nowadays is is uh, wow. It's mind blowing to see how many bands it is. When when we started with Pons Papa, we were a handful. You know, exactly. Maybe you were maybe yeah. You were one of one of a, one of the few. Because yeah. I remember around that time, you know, I could I I I never got the chance to see you live, but I always had like people talking about you know. Yeah, it was great, you know, seeing we saw Panzer Papa live and finally the chance to see a pro Norwegian progressive band on the stage and something like that. Yeah, yeah. But, but now it's completely different, right? It's yeah. you are uh, one of so many bands. Yeah, and, and that's really great because we have uh, a very good scene, very good progressive rock scene, you know, and now we're very healthy scene. We're, we're a lot of very okay, we have this. I've read reviews of Suburban Savages that you have this Scandinavian Norwegian sound as we have touched upon in an interview where a little bit more, you know, darker, you know, songs yeah. from the wood. <laughs> <laughs> a bit more earthy, you know, this, yeah. Earth in Norwegian, yeah, the earth and the moss, you can, you can, you can yeah. sense it, you know. <laughs> uh, but, but we have, but we, at the same time, we also have well, my own band that plays more kind of like sunny, poppy, yeah. progressive yeah, yeah. rock. 
you have uh, a lot of very very good more metal oriented bands you know absolutely uh, and you have bands so now crossing like Mir who's pros- crossing yeah. over from from pop and you know yeah. into yeah. prog which is also a, amazing releasing yeah. amazing yeah. music and, and and what's common for all those bands are they are pretty young people they are people in their mid late 20s yeah 20s. Yeah. yeah and and they are kind of grown up with um i i see that when i i because some of my uh, fellow musicians in my bands are are, are people at the uh, at the age of 20 something young yeah and, younger. and they kind of and they kind of live in a more when when i started out with progressive rock in 86 87 88 ish um um I, I have seen a lot of this band this bands and the albums you know they are coming chronologically yeah you know coming in historically but when you discover progressive rock today you discover everything at the same time yeah, so you, you can listen to Hatfield and the North and you can listen to Marsh Volta and at the, at the, yeah. at the same playlist you know yeah. so, so yeah. they don't care about the his, historic fact that they don't care about the linearity or the historic line of it they just enjoy good music and they want to make music that sounds okay I like Marsh Volta and I like free jazz and I yeah. like Hatfield and North and yes okay everything in the same <laughs> exactly and that i think is also one of the liberating things that has happened recently that a lot of young people doesn't have this you know if you go into like forums where you have a lot of old prog fans you will always get this discussion what is that really prog is that you know mm-hmm. does this really belong in the prog genre and whatever but it feels like a lot of these young musicians aren't really interested in that at all they're just creating music based on the inspirations that they have. And yeah. if a lot of those inspirations are progressive music, then their music turns out to have aspects of progressive music in them. Absolutely correct. And, and especially when you mentioned Marsh Walter, I, I think it's something happened there because Marsh Walter came from a much more indie kind of psychedelic. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Almost you know, and, yeah. Yeah, and and they wanted to create progress. Uh, in uh, I can't remember the name of the guitar, guitar player, but he wanted to. I read an interview, and he wanted to create music inspired by uh, what he grew up with. But he want he didn't want it to sound like the music he grew yeah, up with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a really good mentality. That's a really good mentality because then it's, it's so Marsh Walter sounded really fresh, really different, very yeah. very different. But nobody sounding like them in the late 90s, early 2000s. Nobody sounded like them. So yeah. uh, and I, Because I think, like, you know, listening now to some of those bands I, I mentioned earlier, like Mir, you know, the, mm-hmm. the Norwegian band, or like this UK band Kairos, which takes their inspiration from, you know, those the dead era of the 80s and mixes mm-hmm. it with more newer thing. I think, really, at heart, those guys couldn't give a fuck if they're labeled as progressive or not Mm -hmm. they are they i guess they love to find their audience and they find a lot of them in the progressive crowd but if somebody's going to give them the stamp of approval or not that's not really anything that you know that they care about Uh, and i think that's that's good because what's uh what have been a kind of a not problem but uh well uh, um in the progressive rock scene is that it it's basically male yeah basically middle aged middle aged male with a lot yeah. of money just yeah, to spend right. on yeah. t- t- tickets and tickets and and, and 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 records and uh and it's i feel that the the, uh, the prog scene is very um, it is very good at you know uh, being open for everybody and so on but i think for some people listening only to yes is just as progressive as listening only to rockabilly music you know? i i agree i totally agree with you you know and 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 that thing you know you even if if the music is really accessible to anyone who sits down and listens to it uh mm-hmm. you don't want to come off as you know being uh, elitist or have it being part of a a, a core that where where it's like uh the people who understand it are on the inside and the people who just don't get it are on the outside. And I feel progressive music has become much, much better at that. Uh, 
Just like yeah. any subculture that gets new blood into it, there's an evolution. And you can listen as much as you like to the old Genesis and Yes albums. Anyway, nobody's going to take them away from you. But, you know, they there's now there's also new music maybe inspired by those albums that you can explore if you if you want to and that doesn't necessarily have a a feeling of gatekeeping or anything to to come in contact with yeah yeah yeah. i I agree i I totally agree with that because it's um and if if the progressive rock as a genre or or as a mentality is going to survive you have to have new blood and new blood needs to feel included you know Absolutely. Uh, if 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 a, if a kind of music have a lot of kind of rites and and uh, and rituals and, and and coded language to understand before you can exactly. even listen to a record, uh, well, nobody get uh, uh, and, and especially the young youngsters of yeah. the day are not exactly. interested in that. Of no. course not. Of course not. So so I think I think that's a, a, a you need to make it accessible. You need to make it inclusive. You need to make it something that everyone can enjoy. And I feel like the scene and the community in general are becoming better and better than that. And yeah. also these young people and or even older people like us who are open to all kinds of stuff, we make our own forums now. We make our yeah. own yeah. you know, places for people to discover and be included. So... <laughs> Well, I think with that, I think that's a very nice uh, way to 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 end the talk because you know we <laughs> we we include everyone we can and we you know <laughs> yeah and welcome to should, the talk round <laughs> exactly and people should go and listen to some inclusive and positive music with uh, the Suburban Savages uh, album Demagogue Days. So so thank you, thank thank you. you so much again, Tron, for for thank you thank for being talking here. with me. Yeah. The Prog Talks, produced by The Prog Space. Main host, Rune Belsvik Reynos. Produced by Rune Belsvik Reynos, Vanessa and Matthias Kirsch. All graphics and animations by Vanessa Kirsch. Intro theme by Giuseppe Negri. Outro theme by Zach Munovitz. This was The Prog Talks by The Prog Space. See you in a week.